I turned 16, September 1979. Earlier that year, my grandmother had gotten a new car, so that September birthday, my gift was her 72 Ford LTD. It was big and fast and ugly. <laughs> For those of you who are gearheads, it had a 351 Cleveland, which was plenty. It would seat, I think, 24 comfortably. <laughs> and it was chocolate brown with brown interior, if you can imagine. The only upgrade I made was to put in a eight track player so I could roll down the windows and blare some Bob Seeger or the Eagles. For younger listeners, I did roll down the windows. I did not push a button. One night, four of us piled into the 72 Ford LTD to go to the drive-in movie, which still was around when I was in high school. Some of you have been in Atlanta a long time will remember that if you go north on I-85 from here, just south of what is now Spaghetti Junction, there was a drive-in on the access road there to the right at the intersection of Shambly Tucker. Now, you could get off at Shambly Tucker, go back across the expressway, and go to the office park near St. Pius High School and watch the drive-in with no sound. <laughs> Free. That's how I first saw Saturday Night Fever, which, by the way, is not very good with no sound. <laughs> but this night, we decided we were going to pay full price, the four of us, and go to the drive-in until one of us on the way reckoned that the trunk in a 72 Ford LTD would accommodate two of us and we could go half price. <laughs> I was, at age 16, wrestling in the 105-pound weight class, which made me a candidate for the trunk. <laughs> I don't remember at all what movie we saw that night. All I can remember is the deep shame and guilt I felt. We had done wrong. And I remember the deception and God was watching my deception. God is watching you was one of the great parental tricks of my childhood. When parents cannot be around all the time to watch what you're doing, they say, God is watching you. It's the kind of camcorder fear that was to keep me from any mischief. And mostly it worked, but not on this night. This was the night I found out that the serpent in the garden sometimes wears a Sequoia High School letter jacket. <laughs> the other part of God is watching you was informed by the strain of Baptist life that shaped my childhood faith. The image of God formed by well-meaning preachers and teachers of my childhood was an angry God who wanted to catch me doing bad things, to judge and condemn me for my wicked ways. And their image of God was not fully formed, but my image of God isn't fully formed either. So I need to cut them some slack. But they created the image of a condemning God. But if you listen closely to two verses of today's reading, you'll see how this image is ill-informed. Listen to this most famous of all Bible passages. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, I know I was required to memorize verse 16. I don't think anybody required me to memorize verse 17 because I was to live in the condemnation. I spent so much of my childhood feeling condemned, I wanted to run from God's presence. That story of me hiding in the trunk at the drive-in is just one story of adolescent betrayal. I'm not going to tell you a lot of the others, in case you're wondering. 
but it led me with a, walking around with a profound sense of being condemned. I was trying to find something I could do to earn God's favor, to be forgiven of the deep condemnation I felt, but I walked in the weight of it. One of my pastoral heroes, Carlisle Marney, says that we learned condemnation more from the early church than we did from scriptures. The early church fathers are the ones who laid that on us. To make his point, he quotes the 11th century Benedictine Anselm who says, I am the scorn and scandal of my species, more vile than the beasts that perish, more filthy and noisome than a carcass already putrefied. Jesus, the blessed Jesus, this, this is he, the judge at whom I tremble. He also quotes his contemporary, the French abbot Bernard, who writes, the ghastliness and deformity that I discover there make me a perfect monster and a terror to myself since every corner of my heart is a cage of unclean birds. And Marnie calls all of this guilt a colossal indulgence and a childhood garden of sins. We're walking around, according to him, with an unproductive guilt, a colossal indulgence. Well, I've got to part ways with my pastoral hero on this one. I can't just write off guilt as a colossal indulgence. I mean, the truth is, there are things we ought to feel guilty about. But I want to make an important distinction that's found in the text. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. But here's where the judgment comes from. The light has come into the world, and we loved darkness more than light. It is the role and hope of Christ to save us, not to condemn us. We keep condemning ourselves. We keep stepping out of the light. The good gift of God is eternal life, abundant, overflowing the sides, quality of life. And we keep condemning ourselves because we love the darkness so much. We keep making the bad choices that move us from our best self. And when we do, we live in the condemnation of it. But if your image of God is one of angry parent, always watching you, holding a ruler and waiting to wrap your knuckles if you don't sit up straight, it is a misinformed image. Because God sent the Son in the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now let me redeem Carlisle Marnie because there is a line in one of his sermons that I love and I do agree with. He says, Jesus is the name of our species. That is, if you want to see a fully developed human being, somebody living in the freedom and the abundance and the purpose of a life lived well, if you want to see humanity in its fullness, study the life of Jesus. Live your life in the light of his life, and you will find that living out of his ethic, his generosity, his sacrifice, his attentiveness will lead you not to perish, but to eternal life. Jesus is the name of our species, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now the evangelist John uses this word believe more than anybody else in the New Testament. In fact, he doesn't use the word faith. Faith is a noun. He uses believe, which for John is always an action verb. Belief to John has feet. It's not just an assent to an idea. 
For instance, later in this third chapter, John says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life. You see the parallel? Belief is the opposite of not obeying. Belief is active. Belief in Jesus is the active pursuit of living into his life-giving model of what it means to be fully human. Jesus is the name of our species. And he came to show us the shape of eternal abundant life. He came not to condemn but to save. We are condemned not by Jesus. We are condemned by because of our love of the darkness. Today is the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. And so we're reminding ourselves that it's true that we love the darkness, which is why we need a Savior. It's why we await Easter. If we live noble lives marked by nothing but light and goodness, we wouldn't need a Savior. But we are condemned by our own love of the darkness. Last year, our own Amy Butler went to be pastor of the historic Riverside Church in Manhattan. When I say our own, I mean she's Baptist. And there are not a lot of Baptists who've gone to be pastor of Riverside. That grand cathedral that was built by Mr. Rockefeller to hold the huge crowds that were coming to see Harry Emerson Fosdick preach back in the day. And Amy Butler said recently, so why do we do it? Why would we gather in this place to remind each other that we're broken, hurting, dying? Because it's true. And we all desperately need some place to tell the truth about our lives. And this is the truth. We love the darkness. And it condemns us. It makes us less than we want to be. And we gather here in part because we want to be transformed. We want to be less of what we used to be and more of what we'd like to be. And we need a Savior. And those of us who have looked closely at the life of Jesus know that He is the name of our species. If we ever saw ourselves as children of God, if we ever saw Jesus not as an angry parent but the high expression of humanity, the model of abundant living, the one who came to bring abundant eternal life, if we ever saw a glimpse of what that looked like and obeyed, it would transform us. So what would it look like to be transformed? What would it look like to see that and really believe it? Well, the story I'm going to tell is a famous story. You may have already heard it. But I need to t tip my hat today. A little over a week ago, one of the great preaching legends of our country passed away. Dr. Fred Craddock, longtime preaching professor at Emory University, his funeral was Monday of this week. And Dr. Craddock tells this story. And so today I offer it as somewhat both of illustration uh, and homage to this great preacher. He said that one weekend he and his wife took a long weekend and went up from Atlanta, just a, sh a short getaway, up to Gatlinburg. They rented a small cabin after they got settled in. They went out to eat the first night there. Went to a little mom and pop restaurant, you know, wooden tables and chairs and plaid tablecloths, that kind of thing. They got settled in and noticed that there was an old man wandering the room going from table to table. He kept greeting each guest, everybody he didn't know, went table to table. Sure enough, he made himself around to where the Craddocks were seated and said, well, hi, where are you folks from? And Dr. Craddock, of course, is thinking, I left Atlanta to get away from this, right? 
We came up here to get away from people for a little while, and now I've got to deal with this guy. We're from Atlanta. Oh, what do you do in Atlanta? Craddock said, I'm a professor of homiletics. He was hoping that using the archaic word would throw this hillbilly off and he wouldn't know what he did and he'd just go to another table. Instead he said, oh, you teach preachers how to preach. <laughs> Craddock was a little stunned. With that he pulled up a chair. He said, I have a preacher story to tell you. And now they're really... He's thinking, I've heard this, whatever he's about to tell, I'm sure I've heard this one 50 times. And the old man started in. So I was born and raised right here in the mountains of East Tennessee. And I never knew who my father was. My mother gave me her name, not my father's name, because she didn't want me to hold a grudge against him. I was born out of wedlock, an illegitimate child. And back in those days, there was a big stigma to that. He said, I went around town always feeling badly about myself. I, my classmates at school would say unkind things, as you might imagine. We'd go to town on Saturdays, and I had the feeling that everybody was looking and then whispering and then looking. My mother didn't go to church anymore because she didn't feel welcome. But my grandmother knew how important church was. And so she took me every Sunday to a little Methodist church nestled in the hillside, and we would arrive just as the service was starting. We would sit in the very back, and just as soon as the service was over, we would go out the back door. That way we wouldn't have to talk to anybody. One Sunday, service was over. We took off from the back pew to the back door, and the usher stopped us and said, there's been a snowstorm it's icy and slick out this door. Nobody can go out this door. You're going to need to come and go out the other door. And so he made his way down the congregation, head down, looking back and forth, hoping not to catch anybody's eye, not wanting to speak to anybody. When he made the turn, he felt a big hand on his shoulder. And he turned and looked up into the face of the preacher, trembling he heard the sentence, the question he never wanted to hear, had been avoiding for 14 years. Boy, who's your daddy? And in the silence, the deafening silence, the preacher finally looked down at him and said, Oh, now I see the resemblance. You're a child of God. Go now and claim your inheritance. Dr. Craddock said he felt chills go down his spine, and he said to the old mountaineer, please, please tell me your name. And the old man said, my name is Ben Hooper. And just then, Craddock remembered his own grandfather telling him that the state of Tennessee twice elected an illegitimate as governor, and the governor's name was Ben Hooper. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And our response is to go claim our inheritance as a child of God. Would you stand and sing in response?